Welcome to the final day of the conference, Sunday, Sunday morning, the day of enlightenment, <laughs> illuminating ideas. And uh, to start us off today, I am so excited that um, we have Nick Mitsevich, the uh, director of the Art Gallery of South Australia, to come down Sunday morning all the way from the hills and still said yes <laughs> um, to present for us. Uh, once it was a lot more common uh, to look for enlightenment and guidance and even, I think, um, culture from our religious centres. But where do we look for that now? So I was reminded about the, how important the function of art is, um, even as an artist, during uh, Nick Mitsevich's open, open speech for Dark Heart, which is the uh, Australian biennial where he quoted Robert Hughes. And I just want to uh, read that quote out for you now. The basic project of art is always to make the world whole and comprehensible, to restore it to us in all its glory, its occasional nastiness, not through argument, but through feeling, and then to close the gap between you and everything that is not you. And in this way, pass from feeling to meaning, it is not something that committees can do. It is not a task achieved by groups or by movements. It's done by individuals, each person mediating in some way between the sense of history and an experience of the world. And so how important is our cultural institutions in enabling us as a public to see art? and particularly the Art Gallery of South Australia. And I'm proud to say that our Art Gallery is free to walk into um, for any of us. And since Nick has um, been director uh, here, he has absolutely transformed the gallery. Um, and I think to make it actually more exciting and accessible for uh, a lot, a wider range of ages, uh, which includes apparently January, Friday night discos <laughs> uh, to go with the fashion uh, exhibition that's on almost, almost finishing this weekend, actually. Last day today. Um, but what I especially love is the rehang of the collection. And rather than putting work together by date or by period, it seems to be by subject and even more by emotion, which provides a rich and relevant perspective of our culture and actually asks us really relevant questions rather than a history lesson. So thank you so much, Nick, for being here, and thanks for being in South Australia. <laughs> Welcome, uh, Nick Mitsvich. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here this, week, this morning. Um, in some ways, I feel like the priest on the Sunday morning. Um, um, many people would describe me as the devil rather than the priest. Um, I've been called the butcher of North Terrace, the fact that I run a slaughterhouse, not a gallery, and any number of things. But what's really important is that we um, talk about art um, in a very emotional and um, positive way. And I thank you for that very beautiful introduction. Robert Hughes is a really um, significant figure in um, uh, in art. And I don't know about all of you, but my I still have my original copy of Shock of the New. It's still dog-eared. Um, it has scribbly notes all over it. It has some pages missing. Um, but I still cherish it because it was such an important milestone that Robert Hughes kind of defined for us. He didn't make it happen. He just defined what was happening in art. And um, today I want to talk about um, re-imaging the collection as opposed to re-imagining the collection because I want to return it to something very visual. Um, over the last five years at the Art Gallery of South Australia, I've had the great pleasure of working with 11 curators, 60 works, 60,000 works of art, 700,000 visitors, about 500 donors, um, about 30,000 kids that come to our kids' programs, and the wider city that kind of looks and thinks and maybe comments on what we do from afar. Um, a gallery, I think, should be the heart of ideas, and those ideas should drive 
what artists do rather than a place to tell a history. If you want a history, there's plenty of books to do that. If you want to see a lineage in terms of time, there's the internet or there's encyclopedic galleries to, to go to. But we're after something a little different. We're interested in people and interested in how people interact with art and how that hopefully illuminates lots of ideas in people's heads. Um, Essentially, we're the place where an artist idea collides with someone that loves or is curious about art. And people and the way that they might interact with art is something that we put to our forefront. Our grand Australian galleries, the elder wing of Australian art, recently rehung by the head of Australian art, Tracy Lockweir, was the backdrop to this extraordinary glass installation by Nicholas Follin, a South Australian, and you may have seen some of his work at the Jam Factory um, just next door, which opened on Friday night. Nick's extraordinary big chandelier uh, is really part of his great exploration of all things glass, but he's not a glass artist. Um, in some ways, I think materials are kind of irrelevant, and it's the idea that really is the thing that's most important. On this occasion, Nick Follin chooses to use glass. And he collected nearly 2,000 cut crystal objects, bowls, glasses, decanters, plates, any number of things that early settlers came to South Australia with or purchased while here. And he collected their collective histories and ass assembled them into a work called Untitled Jump Up which hung in the middle of the elder wing of Australian art, sort of site of colonial art, and really refracted the kind of images of the colonial period. It's an archipelago of glass, and it just hovers 1.2 metres above the, um, the floor of the gallery. Suspended on 2,000 pieces of stainless steel wire, the work was installed over the course of 10 nights, because there was the opportunity that a glass object could smash on the ground while installation was happening, the work was installed from 5 p.m. to 6 a.m. over 10 nights. Um, and Nick and um, his assistants carefully um, hung the works. The works on the walls were at times covered with felt to make sure that if there was any damage, it wouldn't smash the things that were on our wall. And we also had a few uh, mattresses on the floor to ensure that if an object did fall, it could merely just bounce. The act of installation was really important part of this work. But what it did was ensure that people could see the colonial collection in a new way, to kind of think about the fact that people risked lots to come to South Australia. It, it was a colony established for free settlers. And there was a great sense of risk about coming here. And the works around the works, uh, the works around on the walls talk about that kind of age of coming somewhere foreign, somewhere that was hostile, somewhere that was unlike any place they'd lived before. And Nick Follin's assemblage made us think about all of those emotions and all of those feelings that people had coming here and how colonization transformed a land owned by the indigenous peoples for thousands of years. There was an incursion here. Nick Follin's work is an incursion into the colonial history that we try to tell. In some ways, it shows a bigger incursion on indigenous Australia as well. He hangs it in an archipelago like the country itself and hovers there and looks both beautiful and precarious at the same time. And the idea, I hope, brought the gallery and the collection to life. One contemporary artist playing with 2,000 objects, hopefully bringing 500 colonial works to life. Um, it sounds ambitious. But from where I stand, um, I think he did an extraordinary job. Led by the two curators, Natasha Bullock and Alexi Glass Cantor, this was part of the 2012 Adelaide Biennial of Australian Art called Parallel Collisions. And this work certainly was an extraordinary collision with the past and the present. And really inspired us to continue to collide the past with the present, to hopefully to squeeze out more meaning from both. 
in 2013, led by curator Jane Messenger, uh, our European collection was transformed from a historical lineage into something that was a little more about the ideas about life. And instead of choosing titles that relate to the history of art, like landscape or portraiture, we chose things about life itself, like the human condition, like love, like beauty, like death, like identity, things that hopefully relate to the lives of the people that come into the gallery. And we collided the past and the present, sometimes up to 2,000 years of collision. In this room, it looked at how the classical tradition is the enduring theme throughout time. We collide glass from the 7th century BC all the way through to the 21st century with Mark Newsom's um, uh, um, iconic uh, lounge, uh, the Lockheed Lounge um, in the middle there. This is a kind of amazing piece of craftsmanship, but it's also an amazing idea taking something that we know throughout time, a simple lounge, and enveloping it in a new approach using traditional craftsmanship to give it a 21st century approach and sensibility. Mark Newsom is an extraordinary craftsman, but he's an extraordinary artist first. And he takes ideas and mashes them up with history, takes his technical skill and injects it in, and this is what you get. We're very fortunate this is the prototype of the Lockheed Lounge. After the prototype, he made 10 editions of that work. And what's so great about the prototype is that it's a bit rough around the edges. You see how he's actually got his little hammer and he's, he's, he's actually um, moulded the sheets um, over, this, um, over this wooden base to create this extraordinary shape. And you see all the indentations, you see the hand of the artist, you see the ragged legs and, and the rubber that he's stuck on and the tool that he put underneath those rubber stoppers to get that, that effect of those spheres on the end of the seat. And to be able to see how the artist conceived, the idea is really quite beautiful and, um, and potent. Um, in this room, we also collide um, so many different ideas about society. So behind Buck with a Cigar by Mark Quinn is a cabinet of curiosities that takes you through glass, metal, ceramics, porcelain, and any number of materials from the decorative arts. And what you see is how throughout time the art artists have been really reflecting to how society um, changes. And Buck with a Cigar is a portrait of a man called Buck Angel. Buck Angel, um, early in his life, decided that he was very uncomfortable in the skin of a woman. And then with the help of science and medicine, made his body equate to his head and he turned into a man. He decided to keep his female genitalia because he wanted to be sexually active, but he wanted to feel that his inside matched his outside. Mark Quinn, the British sculptor, was so inspired by this story of, of uniqueness, of courage, that he wanted to make a sculpture about all the people in our world that were on the fringe of acceptability, that, that, that kind of pushed past society's limits to be the person they wanted to be. And in Mark Quinn's 2007 exhibition, he assembled a cast of seven individuals in our society that he felt had the courage to move beyond social conventions, to really try to embody what they saw their role to be in life. And we were very inspired by this sculpture that talked about how in the 21st century, we are hopefully a more liberated society that celebrates the individual. Unfortunately, that's not the case everywhere, but art is leading the way. And this is a really important work in showing that people can be individuals and can lead important lives in our society. Art, in some ways, ahead of society, ahead of the politics of the world we live in. And the quote by... Um, Robert Hughes reminds us 
that it's about an emotional response to the world we live in and having the courage to do that. People are so important in the story of art and in our in you know, one of our rooms about the human condition, we see portraits throughout time um, showing that people in positions of power and privilege are not un dislike any other members of our society. They're all human. The room that they're in is, um, uh, uh, is in some ways um, really... Um, trumped by Belinda Del Brookia's sculpture of two intertwined horses with their heads missing called Wear All Flesh. And the point of this is to say that it's time in our world to think about the humanity of life. And this is the work that's caused so much commentary in Adelaide over the past two years since it's installed. Um, I have been called the Butcher of North Terrace. I have been asked to resign. I have had letters to the Premier and the Arts Minister saying that I should be sacked and the work should be removed by many people. However, we've had thousands of people say how powerful this is and how they've been moved to tears and how that this is such an emotional work of art. And it's heartening that people can respond in this way, that artists are the leaders of this kind of emotional campaign about humanity, about seeing how the world is today. And this is a violent work. It is somewhat aggressive. But the artist, the Belgian Berlinda del Brucchia, is an artist that is about trying to give us, sense, give us a sense of humanity in the world. She's a pacifist and a vegetarian. She works with a veterinary, veterinarian hospital on the outskirts of Ghent, just near where her studio is. And when a horse at the, um, the university passes away, she works with the veterinarians and she takes the horse to her studio and she wants to celebrate the life of that horse and takes a cast of the horse. Then the horse is humanly um, uh, buried. She then sources um, horse skins from a tannery in Brussels that usually makes horse skins for the, um, for the retail market. And then she, she uses the cast of the horse makes a, um, a sculpture out of it and then stretches the horse skins over that cast to create emotionally charged sculptures about how she wants us to think about the world we're in and, and hopefully encourage us to have a sense of humanity about everything in our world. The horse is such an important symbol because it's, a, it's an animal that we have such a close relationship with. It's not like a pig or a a cow or a chicken, there's something about a horse that has been an important element of our society through time. There's a closeness of relationships. And so the horse is more potent than any other animal that she could think of. And uh, when I saw her work in Europe many years ago, I was moved and the work continually came into my mind. And when we were rethinking about our collection, trying to put our, contemporary, our collection into a context for the 21st century, one couldn't go past Belinda Del Brucchia. She was brimming with ideas and passionate about ideas about life. And she creates emotionally charged work. Um, one of my board members who are and our board at the Art Gallery of South Australia approves all of our acquisitions said to me, Director, that's a very courageous decision. And I said, oh, you sound like Sir Humphrey. And I said, this is not about politics. This is about um, ensuring that art has a really important place in, um, in our world. Um, we knew that this would be contentious and we knew that people would want to sensationalise it. So we spent three months talking to our volunteers and our guides and instead of opening it to the public, we took three months to ensure they understood what this work was ultimately about. And um, we had a great um, series of talks about this work. We also had all of our front of house volunteers, some 284 of them, um, look at this work. Then we had a couple of weeks of bringing our benefactors in because half of our income and all of, um, all of the checkbook that I have to buy art comes from about 500 very passionate benefactors. Um, the doors are open free because of 
those benefactors and we can acquire works and add works to the collection because of them. So I needed to have them on site as well. And so we brought them in slowly and there were some tense conversations with some of my most conservative. <laughs> but in some ways they gave me permission to be a little bit crazy because six months before then we opened the Elder Wing of Australian Art and they thought it was beautiful. So I had a get out of jail card. <laughs> Um, some of them don't like it, but understand and respect what I'm trying to do. It doesn't mean they have to like it, and I respect that of them. It opened to the public, and I was called the, many things, and we received lots of letters. The minister received lots of letters. But, you know, we live in a one-paper one town that's owned by News Limited, but... They, they gave me the great privilege of writing an opinion piece in response to all the letters they had published. And um, the response to that was really positive. I still get people coming in, I still get at least one letter a week about this work, and people saying that it's inhumane, that, that it's, it's vulgar, it's grotesque. However, the artist herself is making that point. So in some ways in a strange and perplexing manner by complaining about it, they actually get it. They understand what it's about. And so I'm interested in touching the hearts and minds of as many people as possible, even the ones that dislike what we're doing. Um, art doesn't have to be liked, but it has to have an idea and it has to be potent. It is sensational, but we live in a sensational world and um, artists have this great role now in the 21st century to mediate the static that comes out of mass media, to kind of give us a freshness about the world, their perspectives of how they see the world through their minds. Um, our displays continue to try to push that idea. We have Richard Long's wonderful earthwork in front of us, which he made here in, in Adelaide in 1979, um, in a room about what is place about. Um, obviously, landscape is a great vehicle to define place, but also the objects of landscape and also people within the landscape, the way that they respond to the things around them helps us kind of make sense of our environment. And this room about identity pulls in traditional landscape paintings from the 15th century all the way through to the 19th century, sculptures and paintings and photography. And in this work you have the, um, on the corner there, you have um, the painting by Gerhard Richter, then Wolfgang Tillmann's photograph, and then Dwayne Hansen's Washerwoman in the corner, all talking about their place in the world. Um, we continue that in this fabulously decorative room um, that plays into what Adelaide does so well. When we were conceiving the way that our collection could tell stories, I thought a lot about my first impressions about Adelaide as an outsider. I only came here four years and six months ago, and it was probably the only time that I kind of really seriously thought about Adelaide was when I arrived here. I came here because I loved the collection and I thought that it was the most amazing collection in Australia and I thought it would, it would be a great honour and a great privilege to work with it and I still feel that today. And um, I thought about the gallery, the building and the city, such a controlled city, full of planning, um, scared of what what, what's on the edge of it, the desert. And every time I say that to people that live here, they keep, they keep shaking their heads to me and say, we're not at the edge of the desert. But as an outsider, I feel Adelaide sits on the edge of the desert. And the original settlers must have feared the desert because they so constructed a city that was so planned and so at odds with the Australian environment. Um, it's probably Australia's most planned and controlled and manicured city. I love that for it. And I was interested in those ideas and wanted the Art Gallery of South Strait to appear to be an eccentric mansion by one of these great early planners who manicured the city and controlled it and tried to create their own worlds from where they came from. 
And I thought about that person and I thought about what the gallery might look like if suddenly an eccentric art collector threw open the doors of his or her mansion to let the public in. And I thought that's what the Art Gallery of South Australia potentially should look like. So I encouraged our curators to hang more, to, to talk, think about the relationships that a person or, my, person or an individual might have when carefully crafting and hanging works next to each other. Thinking about the relationships that one might have and thinking about how one might live. And we created this kind of unique eccentric interior that harked back to a private residence rather than a public institution because what I wanted most to create was a sense of intimacy because intimacy opens the doors to emotion. And um, when I kept on saying to our curators, I want more on the walls and more and more and more, please, um, they thought I'd lost my mind. They'd heard that I was interested in contemporary art and they were slightly be bewitched by the fact that I wanted more historical works on display, more decorative arts, more furniture, more silver, more gold, more glass, more jewellery, more everything. Because when you have a private collection, you want to celebrate it and you want to be surrounded by it. Um, I wish I could put the whole 60,000 works of art on display and I have this crazy idea to do that. <laughs> and, um, you know, I've been pitching it to government and they don't think I'm too silly about it. They like the idea. So maybe one day in the, in the next decade or so, we might be able to do that. Um, it's my long-term plan because everyone in this city and state owns this work and they should be able to enjoy it in different ways. Um, so this from the sort of seduced and beauty room juxtaposes 500 years of art making just on this wall and we have Bill Henson in conversation with so many artists from the 15th century and beyond. Henson working in the medium of photography while his colleagues on the wall push oil paint to the, to the highest levels possible. They're all interested in the same thing. It's all about human emotions. It's all about trying to tap into the thing that one can't describe. And um, I love this wall, of course. Um, it's um, so wonderful. And if you look at some of the models in each of the works, ironically, there's the same pose that these, um, these um, um, sitters have throughout time. If, if it's not the head, it's the shoulders, it's the eyes. And hopefully that if you're not interested in 15th century painting or if, if you're not interested in 21st century photography, those connections will hope and op hopefully open something and illuminate something for you, even if it's just the beautiful dresser that kind of has a relationship with the Morris-inspired wallpaper. It isn't Morris paper, but it's a 21st century metallic paper. Because... We're very interested in pushing the past and the present together. And in this great wall of, of beautiful women, we have Gaines, Gainsborough in, um, in conversation with Rodan and, and um, um, Diane Arbus in the photographic print. It's about seeing how beauty changes throughout time and how time is this wonderful measure of society. Uh, then we have the work in the middle of the room by the Swiss artist Thomas Hirschhorn. And um, in 2010 or 2011, I saw an extraordinary exhibition by Thomas Hirschhorn and it was all ephemeral and, you know, it was all bits of paper ripped up and gaffer tape all over the place. And I thought that this was just an extraordinary work, but there was no way I could take a container full of gaffer tape home. So we asked Thomas Hirschhorn to make a sculpture for us that was more appropriate for a public collection. And he made this work for us called Twin Subjector. And it's two mannequins that are covered in thousands and thousands of screws. Um, how the sort of society um, totally um, envelops us and tries to impose ways of being. Um, and the nails kind of impacting on these two silhouettes as both brutal, harsh, um, but also uh, something very telling about the world we're in. It shimmers like a diamond with all the screwed heads, but as you go up, the kind of 
the violence of drilling into these mannequins and you see the splintering of the of the gesso on the mannequin is violent and brutal as well so there's this beautiful duality in amongst the beauty and the seduction of this room there's also the brutality of such impositions and then we end um, with a room about death and you have um, the the story of um, Romeo and Juliet in the corner by Leighton with Juliet laying on her deathbed and um, uh, Watts's painting of the angel coming down um, to um, take a soul um, playing against the foreground of um, an Australian sculptor Alex Seaton's um, extraordinarily beautiful and poetic and tragic um, work about um, death at war this child under a, cl a cloth that is a flag carved in exquisite marble again craftsmanship taken to the highest levels but overplayed by the extraordinary idea of this poetic and tragic event to remind us that war is about individuals and about loss and um, a very potent work two of my family members, my brother and sister, are both in the Australian Army and they've served in Afghanistan. And um, every day um, my family watched the news reports and we hoped and willed that our loved ones would return unhurt. And that's a story that's been played out in hundreds and thousands of homes in Australia and also thousands and thousands of homes around the world. It's interesting how the news reports don't actually capture it as beautifully or as poetically as this artist does. And it reminds us the fragility of the life we live. And ironically, it's made out of marble, something hard, something unforgiving. And it just reminds us the fragileness of the life we lead and how humanity is really important. Um, Another display with the work of um, the British artist duo Jake and, Jake and Dinos Chapman with their extraordinary vitrine about the horrors of um, Nazi Germany. This work called Swing, Swings and Roundabouts um, looks at the atrocities of Nazi Germany but puts it within a 21st century context where the perpetrators are not the Nazis, they're replaced by capitalism and capitalism ravaging its fury on the innocent um, is the theme of this vitrine. And surrounding the vitrine is um, the work of um, the Spanish artist Goya. Um, Jane Messenger, our European art curator, hung the full set of Goya's disasters of war from the 18th century around the room and provocatively hung some of them in the shape of a cross. And again, I remind you, I'm not giving you a Sunday morning sermon. <laughs> but I have talked about humanity and loss and showing you a crucifix. <laughs> um, this, again, plays within the potency of both of these works and bringing these ideas together with some 300 years in between hopefully charges up more and asks the viewer to think about how man's inhumanity to man with 300 years in the middle is unchanged and we as a human race need to continue to think about we continue to make the same mistakes in our world and um, I finish with the newest work in our collection um, this is a work that we commissioned uh, by Alex Seaton again an East Coast Australian sculptor working in a, a marble called Wombian marble and Wombian marble is a marble that's unique to New South Wales. And what's so beautiful about Wombian marble is it has the veins of sandstone through it, so it's not cold, it's warm, and so it appears at times like a human body. And Alex carved 28 life jackets for the Adelaide Biennial of Australian Art, his most ambitious work to date. And uh, we were very fortunate to be able to acquire this work through the passionate support of 25 private individuals. And um, I should add that the Belinda del Brucchia was bought by the same group of people. Um, what's interesting about that group of people is that they have to have faith and um, I don't tell them what we're acquiring. 
And so it's called the director's project. And so there has to be some trick in it and there has to be something that's different to everything else. So I talk to them about contemporary art and I tell them what we want to achieve, but I don't tell them what the work is. That's a surprise for them. So they ultimately have to have faith. And so they give money because of passion and faith, not because they like it. And um, each year the work is presented to them after they've paid their money. <laughs> and some, day, some years, we've done it for four years so far, some years I've worried that I've stepped somewhere that, that, that concerns them, that, they, that I lose them. But so far we haven't lost them yet. And we've actually increased the number by two this year. And um, they give anywhere between five and fifty thousand dollars each. And um, they know they're part of a collective that acquires things that are ambitious, both in terms of price, because of its scale, but also because of ideas. But ultimately, it speaks to the gallery's collection and its historical archive in a very important way. And this work by Alex Seaton continues that tradition. And um, those private individuals come to the come and have a preview. Um, they meet the artist and um, they're the first to see this work. And um, on this occasion they were so um, bemused because I didn't let them near at the work. So they were kind of a distance away from it. And they thought that this was 28 life jackets painted just laying on the floor. And um, like halfway through my talk, I went, they're marble. And suddenly they just go, oh, there's this, oh. and suddenly I knew that I had them. Um, and what's great about this group of people is that they don't hold back. They're passionate individuals about art. So I know what they think. Some of them didn't like Belinda Del Brookia at all, but they liked the idea and they liked that art was so important that they could, they, at times they couldn't look at it, that it was, it was so difficult. Um, and the same can be said about Alex Seaton's work. Here in conversation with um, two sculptures by Rodin, and another crucifix. I don't know what I'm doing today. I didn't think about this. <laughs> by Colin McCann, a painting by the New Zealand artist Colin McCann. Um, of course, I had to have a backdrop. So we have this fabulous 17th century painting of the sea to put it in context. Because art has to be about theatre as well for me. Some people don't need it, but I need theatre. I need a diorama and I need a backdrop. Um, when I was um, 22 and I left uni, I was very quiet and couldn't even think about standing up here to talk. But what was interesting, once I put a picture behind me, suddenly that picture gave me the courage to be able to stand here and talk to you all. Somehow that picture made me want to be a storyteller in my career. And... Um, I continue that when I put works on display. I think about the way the diorama might play out, the theatre of that, the way the things interact, um, because I'm not very good at this without this behind me. And it's this that gives me the kind of excitement and courage. And so when we put a room together like this, I think about all of those things to create excitement for you all to kind of hopefully that you're not complacent about this one object, that you get excited about what's being played out on behind you, behind me. Um, and um, I think that's the potency of art. And um, we have... Um, so these works are currently installed in um, our gallery at the moment, all about the journeys that we go on in life. And sometimes those journeys are spiritual journeys and we have religious paintings in this room. Sometimes those journeys are the journeys of discovery, the journeys of, of um, looking into oneself and pushing oneself to be better, to, be, to, to make sure that we do something profound in, in, our little, in our lives. Sometimes they're about innovation, Sometimes they're about finding relief and some redemption in our world. 
And um, Alex Seaton chooses to make his journey about telling a tragic story about 28. Um, well, we don't know if they're 28. Um, we found um, the Australian Defence Force found 28 life jackets washed up on the Cocos Islands in 2012. And there were no other signs of life. There was no wreckage. There was no bodies. There were just these 28 life jackets. The only clue was that in one of these life jackets was some Iranian currency um, tucked into one of the life jackets. So Alex Seaton thought about those 28 people that potentially lost their lives and wanted to memorialise them as individuals and made 28 life jackets, all individuals, all individually carved. Some of them are joined and um, you see this wonderful relationships in some of them where there is the mother and daughter or mother and son or the Pieta um, in some of the compositions because he's interested in the history of sculpture, interested in the history of the craft of making, but isn't shackled by it and uh, isn't necessarily just struck on being a marble carver. He adds a nylon um, strip to these to give them a sense of reality and also to make you kind of question if it is actually marble. So he memorialises the lives of the people that were potentially lost, trying to come to Australia for a better life. The work is actually called um, Someone Died Trying to Have a Life Like Mine. Um, marble, ironically, sinks to the bottom of the ocean and these life jackets are, are impossible to save one's life being made out of marble. Um, and I think is a telling reminder that we in Australia have a wonderful life and that people all around the world want to have a life like ours. Um, and they go to extremes to have that. Um, and again, this is emotional, but it's also political. And artists like Goya remind us that great art comes from the heart, but also it's about politics, about society, and about the world we live in. Uh, I end you with where I've kind of begun. The Lockheed Lounge um, works from um, various eras from our collection, reflecting in the mirrored wall of the gallery space, which um, continues on in infinity. For many, for many of you in this room that have been in this room, which is the first room that you encounter when you walk through our European collection, it's a small, modest room, but the use of a simple mirror makes the room continuous, makes it continue on, because it's a symbol about art. Art is this wonderful continuum through society that continues to remind us about our humanity and our important role in communicating that to the members of the public um, and hopefully making us a more interesting, a better place for where we found it. Um, so I add, I, I end with a philosophical tone. However, I like to say that what is powerful about art is that it's made by the hands and the minds of individuals. That's what makes it important. And it's not made by corporations or groups. It's made by powerful, strong, courageous individuals that want to add something to our world. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. I have 15 minutes of questions, if anyone has any questions. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, we um, we raise fifty percent of our income for our running costs from members of the public, and a hundred percent of our income for acquisitions from members of the public. And over the course of the last few years, we've doubled our um, benefaction um, from private individuals. From the corporate sector, we've actually gone backwards slightly, um, but it's private individuals, and I think it's the fact that um, my team has worked closely with people 
to connect them to what we do on a very intimate level. Fundraising for me is not a corporate pursuit. It's an individual pursuit about you and your relationships with individuals. You have to wear your heart on your sleeve and you have to be, it's very labor intensive. And I spend more than half of my time doing that. I wish I could spend less of my time, but that means that everything else can happen and the wheels can keep spinning. Um, in a world where government funding continues to reduce, um, we don't let that get in our way. And um, I have this cliche that I keep saying to my staff and to my board, and they're sick of me saying it, but I keep saying it, money follows a good idea. Um, but you just don't have to, it's not just about having a good idea, it's about being able to tell people the right way about your good idea. And so um, the 27 people that I have now, I spend a lot of time trying to be intimate about what's in my head with them so they understand what I'm trying to do. So, And also our bigger group of 500 benefactors, I need them to be our allies and I need them to be our ambassadors. So we do lots of things with them on an intimate level um, to try to encourage them to know more about our business, encourage them to think about the sorts of things we're trying to do. So if they're passionate about colonial art, and so I have this big group of people that love colonial art, and that's all they love. But I want to continue, I want them to continue to love colonial art, and I want them to continue to fund colonial art, but I just don't want them to get in the way of the other stuff. So I am... Um, I need to try to tell them what I'm trying to do. And so I need to tell them about other things besides colonial art so they understand the big picture. And so far that's worked. But as I said, um, it's about intimacy and about confidence um, and letting them in and letting them be a part of what you're trying to do and also enlisting the help of as many people as possible. So at our gallery, Benefaction doesn't happen from our development department. Many of my senior staff are involved in benefaction on different levels. So benefaction is part of all of our jobs and we're all responsible for nurturing benefaction. Even if you're an assistant curator, you have to have benefaction as part of what you do because without it, we'll be half the size of what we are and we wouldn't be able to buy anything and we wouldn't be able to grow our collection. And so that's what benefit. I could talk about benefaction for hours. Um, um, I have always loved working in the benefaction area. And um, I supposedly got the job, uh, board members tell me, because I was good at raising money. Um, but I don't necessarily think I'm good at raising money. I think I'm just a storyteller. And... Um, I think that in any organisation or any group, there can't be just one person responsible for raising money. It's a, it's a group pursuit and it's a pursuit that has to filter in to every element of the business, regardless of if it is a business or a non-for-profit or whatever it is. And um, everyone has to be a part of it. Obviously, there has to be someone that direct the tra directs the traffic and makes judgments about who talks to who, talks to who and who says what. Um, but, um, you know, I'm very proud of the team of people that I have. Um, I am the one that's directing the traffic, but it's a collective achievement and um, they've all been a part of uh, making sure that we can be ambitious about various things that we do. hung with paintings of yes. people in various stages of undress. I was wondering if this was put together before or after the controversy about his exhibition in Sydney and to what extent it's a reaction to that controversy. Um, the, that's been on the walls for three years now um, and no one's ever complained about that work at all. Um, I've, I think Bill Henson is 
one of Australia's most significant artists. And um, I hung it because I think he's significant. And um, what's important with Bill Henson's work is to see it within a historical context. The girl in the picture actually is wearing a slip, so she's actually not naked. So um, it's not as provocative as it could have been. Uh, but um, the, the discussions that there's been in the media, um, it's quite interesting that no one's ever complained about that work on the wall of our gallery. Um, it's quite fascinating um, that the controversy really reigns in the mass media rather than in the practical parts of our society in some ways. Um, you know, the whole, whole issue of child pornography is abhorrent and um, I don't support that. Bill Henson is an artist and I will defend an artist. Oh, sorry. What I love about what you've been saying is you've been putting the contemporary out there, but in fact what you've been doing is pushing the traditional forward. Bringing, you are really bringing the traditional forward and people who maybe wouldn't look at it, you're forcing them to well, look at it. I, I, th I think... I think it's it's kind of where you stand. So it could be either. Um, in some ways, um, I want people that are only interested in contemporary art to to think about that there is a lineage that this comes from. Um, but I also want people that only are interested in historical art to think about that artists that make work today are making work about the same big themes that artists 200 years ago. So um, I am wanting to be aspirational about broadening the audience for art. So sometimes, particularly institutions like mine, get hooked into this idea that we need to grow the audience full stop and its numbers. But we also need to widen and, deme and, and make the understanding of art much, much broader. Um, I'm not interested in silos or saying this is where you see contemporary art or this is where you see glass or this is where you see ceramics um, I'm, or this is where you see historical art. I'm interested in the relationships that are there um, because the ones that I've just listed are kind of constructed classifications. And um, libraries are good at classification art galleries shouldn't be. Um, and um, I think that to broaden the appreciation of art, one needs to also focus in on widening the number of people that like c contemporary or historic. Why should there be either or or? And so what I'm saying is the white box is dead that the grey, warm grey box is reign supreme because all of the walls are green. My favourite colour is warm grey and I have um, 12 shades of it in the gallery because <laughs> it's dramatic <laughs> um, and everything is always trimmed in a white that I call, it's called raw diamond. It's the house style. Um, it took me 32 whites to get the right white and I had about 60 greys to get the right greys. But I'm just being silly now. But... Um, it's about creating a dramatic backdrop so both the historic and the contemporary can play out with equal measure. Um, when you put something in a white box, you instantly say that it's contemporary. But um, I don't have one. Oh, do we have one white room? No, we don't have any white rooms at all. Um, in the upcoming Trent Park exhibition, he's going to put a white room in. And I just said, oh, do you have to? And he said, yes, I have to. And I went, fine, then if you have to. Um, but, you know, I see the white box as a symbol of this approach to contemporary art that's dead and over. You know, it's a moment in time. Um, we were, you know, we're all in pursuit of the white box, um, but it's, 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 it's fake. It's an imitation of the world. And so I'm interested in putting things back into the real world. And so the kind of eclectic mansion the eccentric mansion format works for this collection, works for this city. Um, it also works for the time that we're in now because one always is trying to define it, 
the time that you're in. One can never do that. Um, but the things that I can pick up is that, you know, we're living in a time of eclecticism and um, where the past and the future are kind of jostling with one another. We don't necessarily know exactly what the future looks like. We're constantly reshaping what the past was about because we're learning more about the past. And so the cliches of some of the things that history documented are being killed off and being replaced by factual evidence. So the past is, is we're living in a revisionist period. And so we're worried about the future or optimistic about the future. So all of that is is where we're at right now. And so we've never lived in a time with so much information and so much opportunity, but also with so much uncertainty. And for me, that that means art needs to be at the forefront of saying something very potent about the world. And yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> I just w want to say that uh, when I first saw those life jackets at, at the Dark Heart exhibition, which I was referring to before, I was moved to tears, which is, which is amazing because we see we actually can read so much about the tragic um, refugee situation that Australia has decided to put itself in, but an artwork like that. So thank you so much for coming, Nick. Um, we just have some really boring announcements after that amazing talk. <laughs> um, firstly, Jess Dare, his uh, mobile phone is at registration. <laughs> Did you know that? I'm so impressed it was quiet during the whole presentation. <laughs> um, we have um, a short break for um, tea and coffee. But also, um, don't forget to go to site particularly on the second level of site, uh, which is the trade show, the Glass trade show. And um, this is the, as this is the last day of the conference, this is the last day to make any purchases. And morning tea is your perfect opportunity. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Thank you so much.